Roy Barker, my guest today, started out in the entertainment business with his family. They ran a variety show in Melbourne in the 1960s and 70s. When he grew up, he got involved in other things and moved away from the entertainment industry and didn't come back until he was in his 50s. So Roy is a great example that never give up on your dreams. Roy, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you. Wow, it's a joy and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I have to ask you about your family and the variety show. Well, yeah, as well, I'm one of seven. Okay. And as we were growing up, mum and dad were involved in um, performing a variety of shows. It was uh, songs from the musical shows and um, uh, they didn't really have an acting background, but they used to sing and dad would tell jokes in that show. And um, they were always doing that. We sort of grew up and uh, most of us ended up being in that show for a little bit of time. So um, it, was, it was variety, so you were singing, you were standing up and telling jokes and yes. whereabouts were they doing this? Well, they used to travel to bowling clubs around Melbourne and senior sits. Okay. And um, yeah, yeah, and uh, my dad kept doing it. And uh, he was doing it in his last year, he retired when he was 80. Wow. He did 60 shows a year up until about then. But he did go and learn to tap dance when he was 67. <laughs> he and my mother would have got on really Correct. well. My mum used to tap dance when she was in her 60s. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, it was great. So you started out, you, you got your break as it were in that show. And then what happened after that? I was, I was only about 14 or 15 and it wasn't a very cool thing yes. to do. But I did love it and I loved musicals. But um, so, I didn't, so I didn't do that anymore. I sort of went and um, finished school year 10 and went and did an apprenticeship in the printing industry because my, also my br family are all printers. Right. And um, uh, it was an inter in interesting time, but I always had this urge to want to make films or be involved in films or f act. And um, I started writing to television stations when I was in year 10 uh, because I knew I was destined for printing otherwise. Mm. So I was like, uh-oh. Um, and it didn't come about until later. I was doing an apprenticeship as a printer plate maker. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, when I was 17, I got a letter from Crawford's asked me to come in for an interview, which was the most exciting thing in the world. And uh, I went there and, and um, I spilled my heart out. And uh, I got the job as a trainee and I lasted 18 months. And I loved every second of it. But I was the poorest man I ever met. <laughs> and no money. In my family, you had to pay your own way. We were a poor family. We weren't wealthy. Uh, we are fairly low socioeconomic uh, family, big family in a commission area. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you, you, you had to pay your own way, there was no one going to support my love of art. So I, I left, I went back to printing and stayed. I did a little bit of amateur theatre along the way, but had three children. Mm -hmm. And um, I really wanted to learn um, this, the craft of performing. And it was a dream. Um, and a desire, but it didn't come to fruition until after I was 50. Mm. And uh, I, 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 maybe a, a few things happened in my life at that time, but it was something I always wanted to do. And I thought, well, I have to give it everything I've got. So I went, and that's when I really sort of dedicated my time to both running a business, but also in, in that making that business afford me to go and study acting. Mm. How have you managed to handle that duality how does the business support you to go off and do your acting? It's a real discipline yeah. because I have to manage time really well. But I also have um, a partner in that business, my brother, who runs the production side of things and I run admin. But I set the business up in a way where my clients are ordering online and it's sort of, so they order um, from a warehouse. But I also have staff that are really um, dedicated and help me do that. Mm. So I think I'm uh, very transparent with everybody about what my dream is, what I want to do, mm. but I have to take care of them as well. Um, and it, it, I seem, it seems to work. Mm. It seems to me that discipline is something that is you're very strong on. There's quite a lot of the through line in what you do that is really based on being very committed and very disciplined with how you manage your time yeah. and indeed how you create, I think, your craft. 
um, I know that one of the things that you do is you are very focused on making sure that you're continuing to learn lines regularly, whether you're working on something or not. Yeah. Can you tell me about that and, and what else you do to keep your craft active between gigs? See, I think there was a time where I thought as I get older, it's harder to remember lines. Yeah. Right? But I also think that's a muscle. So if I'm learning a monologue all the time, if I'm not learning a script, that will help me flex that muscle. Mm. And I think that works. Learning lines is the, you know, the small part of it, really, mm. even though sometimes it feels like the big part. It's the small part, but getting them in as quickly as possible. So I am very disciplined with um, getting into the script, getting the lines down, and um, not making any decisions on, but just knowing what mm. I'm going to say. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think that's because I'm fearful of not remembering what I have to say. Mm. So, yeah. But I do do it every day. That's, that's fantastic. Do you do vocal work every day as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. And usually my voice work is, because at, at the, um, uh, as some work I've done, they've, I've been taught, you know, and do voice work with a little straw. Oh. If you want to be quiet, not too loud, um, through a small straw, that's a really good way um, of doing it. And just uh, singing. A uh, car, great place, you know, to the karaoke, I guess. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else that you do on a fairly regular basis? Uh, yeah, uh, yoga stretches. And if I'm not in a yoga class, I just do the stretches. And um, uh, having uh, done Alexander with posture and movement, they're good. Those spiral rolls are fantastic mm. that Penny mm. taught me. So those things I, I do constantly. Mm. Um, and I think because I want to be flexible and agile and ready to go. If the call comes to do an audition, mm. I like to say, well, I've done the work, I'm ready. You've done a, a wide range of work since you came back to acting eight or nine years ago. You've done quite a lot of student films. You've done some uh, independent theatre, independent films. Um, is there, what of that has been the most interesting and challenging for you? Most challenging. First thing that popped to my head, the say most challenging would be, I was offered a trip to China to tour China, to play Shakespeare, um, <laughs> four ro four characters, two plays, and uh, three week or four week tour, with nine actors and um, two weeks rehearsal. I'm much ado about nothing, playing two characters. I had actually four days rehearsal on the floor. And I didn't know the lines. I was reading from the book. Oh, my goodness. So that was the most oh. challenging. M the work got more, and uh, I'd never done Shakespeare. So to do that audition, I got um, Charlie Sturgeon, who's a great Shakespearean actor here, that, to give me some lessons, <laughs> to give me some <laughs> idea. I never thought I was good enough to do Shakespeare. Right. I thought, I don't, I'm not smart enough. Mm. I can't do it. I can hardly read it. But he helped me. And I got to the audition, and... Um, I was going for the role of Fry Lawrence, Romeo and Juliet, and um, got the role. So I started learning Fry's lines, and they said, no, 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 we need you. There was, so there's three more characters, and, uh, and um, this is when we're going. So I didn't think I could do it. There's no way I can learn two characters in a Shakespeare play in four or five days. My partner, Louise, said, ah, oh, you'd be right. And I said, I won't be right. <laughs> I'm not going to be right. And, um, so I got onto that plane and, and um, all I did non-stop was read the script, change seats, ask the scene partner, can you read with me? And just kept drilling and drilling and drilling. And when we arrived, I just wanted the hotel room on my own so I could just keep learning. But it was really challenging. Mm -hmm. But I would have said no if I knew what I had to do. I would have said no. But because I said yes and I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. I actually got there and I actually did it. Because of that experience, I got the opportunity to audition for the Pop-Up Globe when they came to Melbourne. Yeah. And I got, um, got to play with them for five months. Yeah, and that was a remarkable experience. I mean, it was. was great fun to watch your work. Thank you. And, and, um, and tremendous opportunity. It was. And it must have transformed your work. It did. I, I think I went to a new level. I, I mean, being on stage every day, mm -hmm. but also having those disciplines to... Um, you know, the rapier training, the, the movement, voice. Yeah. They're the ones that like taught me about the straw, the voice work, um, all the warm-ups and 
and and being in that uh, arena of the stage and uh, having to project and it did change my voice. It was mm. Uh, mm. a really good thing to do. I was very, very fortunate, mm. but it's because of um, the nightmare of China, <laughs> <laughs> which is it's really interesting how that works. Absolutely. And, and what was it like taking Shakespeare to China? I mean, how did the audiences receive it? Well, in China, which is really interesting, they have big screens with subtitles. Oh. So um, I still, I'm doing Shakespeare, I still want it to be right. Because mm. you can't make it up. No. Can't paraphrase it. No. <laughs> no. But these theatres, they're 3,000 seaters. They're massive theatres. And it's like, what? <laughs> but they were, it was fantastic. And my challenge was, I'll see if I can get them to laugh. Because there's some funny lines in Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. So when I got a really big laugh one night on a line, it sort of shocked me. And um, then I heard later there was a, uh, an American contingency in the <laughs> audience. But, but I'll take it as I did get the audience to laugh Absolutely. in China. In China, But mm. it was a brilliant experience. Mm. So those have been quite pivotal experiences, yes. I think, both of those. Yes. You've also had um, some other really pivotal experiences, yes. like the dressmaker. Yes, like mm. being cast in the dressmaker, which was, um, you know, quite a special moment. Mm. Um, that was actually one of my worst auditions. Oh, okay. I auditioned as a doctor for um, a very well-known casting director who I've always wanted to meet. And when I got the opportunity to be in that room, I was very excited. I think I took a doctor's coat, which was such a mistake. <laughs> anyway, we don't need that. So I did it and um, it was horrible. I felt I was horrible. I got, we can't actually had tears thinking I should never do this I should not do this what am I doing and um, I got the call to say they loved you they, you've got the role of the doctor mm -hmm. so I was so excited about it and then of course I get to spend the day with Kate Winslet and, you know, she came up and said I'm Kate well I'm Roy and uh, you know I worked with Hugo Weaving on that day and mm -hmm. and Julia Blake felt a bit surreal but this is the job and I think the people that you meet and the situations that you find yourself in, extraordinary. That's an absolute highlight mm. for me, even though I don't end up much in the film at the end. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I had a great day. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to make, that really you can't control what is going to end no. up on the screen in no. any way. The experience that you have on the day, on the set, yeah. is, is the reality. Absolutely. Now, the film or the TV show, in, in, is in a sense, not real. Yes. What's real is the experience and the opportunity yes. to interact with yeah. some amazing people yes. who are extraordinary at their craft. I think so. Do you know, I think I've probably made in the last six years about 50 films. My Short films, goodness. some that I didn't get finished, some feature films. Yeah. But I would say just conservatively 50. Wow. And I really enjoyed two of those or three. <laughs> Not the process, uh, looking at. Oh, watching the film. Oh, watching. Yeah. Mm. Otherwise, I can't, you know. Yeah. I hope one of the ones that you enjoyed was The Mermaid, because I thought that was an amazing I did, piece. Uh, I did enjoy that. Yeah. But the director is um, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Fantastic director. Yeah. And, did um, she write the piece as well? Yeah, she did. And it was a dream of hers to make this film. Mm. And um, they auditioned lots of people. Uh, and I was very lucky to be cast as Herb mm. in that. And because um, it shows a, a quite a menacing character, mm. but quite a, a simple man and, a, mm. you know, uh, so quite introvert. And the rehearsal process for all that was just. I really soaked it up, I really enjoyed it. Mm. But there was a moment in that which actually did change me a bit, courage-wise. Mm. I had to jump off the pier at Altona about 1am. Oh my goodness. In the middle of winter. <gasps> and I can't swim. Mm. So there's a few factors in there. Wow. But I said, I will do it. But I can't swim, but I will do it. So I thought, really, will I drown? I don't think I can drown because it's Th they didn't around. have someone in the water. So there was a safety off a dri diver under the pier right. in a wetsuit. Yeah. Right. So I had to jump off the pier. I'd actually throw that co my person I was working with, the other actor, yeah. 
Um, there was a couple of, there was a stand in as well. Mm. She's wrapped in glad wrap. Throw her off the pier and then I jump off the pier. Mm. And in that moment, it wasn't me jumping off the pier because if it was me, I wouldn't. Mm. And I felt something. And when I hit the water, it's the coldest thing I've ever felt in my whole life. It was quite painful. Yeah. But it was really, um, it changed me because it, it, I've, since then, I've been snorkeling off the back of a boat, jumped off the back of the boat up at the Whit Sundays and went snorkeling. And um, I could swim, I could do it. And because I relaxed in the water, I just floated and thought about it, the air in my lungs. So the scary parts for that, I had to drown. So we had to film in a very, in a three metre pool and I had to put bricks on my feet for me to sink. That's a scary feeling. I had to pull me under. But because I kept floating, I had to expel the air, put the weights on my feet, expel the air and then go to the bottom. And as I'm going down, <laughs> I'm thinking, I hope I can release my feet out of these things easy enough. I felt safe. Wow. Because I was trusting the people around me. A personal breakthrough. Of it was some personal fear. breakthroughs in there. Okay. Yeah, fear of drowning, fear of wow. the water. I'd never jump off a pier. No. So d at that moment, were you actually the character? And yeah, it was yeah, the absolutely. character that jumped off the pier and not you? Absolutely. Isn't that interesting? I was absolutely somewhere else. Yeah. And then that was a pivotal moment because I knew I can, yeah. I can do this. I can absolutely be someone else. Wow. And then that film's a good film. It's a very Because I can see, I don't see me, I see this character. I'm not looking at me. No, you're not. And so maybe out of all those films I did, only it was only good in a couple of them. <laughs> and, and the other thing I wanted to ask you about that particular film was you, it, it was very black. You yeah. were doing some pretty dreadful things. Yes. How did you prepare for that? How did you, most importantly, how did you detox? How did you get yourself right. back out? See, music takes me into a character and music also takes me out, okay. which I learnt at Elizabeth Kemp. Mm. which I've been very grateful that I got to work with her. Mm. So the music takes me in to that world, mm. but also brings me back out. So there's music I listen to that takes me back to some fantastic times in my childhood with family, you know, yeah. musicals, back yeah. to these times. And it really w awakens, uh, really pushes everything out. And then, mm. and then I realise, you know, this is, this is um, on, off. Mm. Mm. So I can detach. Mm. It's one of the things that I think is really important and perhaps not taught well is is how do you recover from yeah. those sorts of very, very often traumatic experiences. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it's that. What I suffer with sometimes, I think we all do, when you're having such a great time, like with the Pop-Up Globe or Travelling China or doing a great film that is so connected yeah. with everybody, yeah. is when it stops. Yes. You feel like you've fallen off a cliff and you can get a little bit down. So you get the blues or yeah. feeling a little bit down. And I think that is a thing that I always uh, think about. That w okay, what am I doing next week? And um, to look after myself. Mm. So I think there's always, because I felt that early days, like when I finished the first Elizabeth Kemp, I was, I f was so down because mm. I, so, I was so high with yes. that class yeah. and in that room yeah. with the, all the exploration. And yeah. I was high for days after yeah. this. Yeah, I was in love. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, I was in love with everything mm. that we'd done, with all the people I'd worked with. Mm. I really felt it. Mm. Uh, something else I wanted to ask you about is you've had quite a lot of experience working as a guest artist in television yes. shows. I think it's a really hard thing to do, <laughs> really is. hard. No doubt it is. Can you talk about how, you know, what is it that you think is hard about it and how do you, how do you manage that? Well, it is very, very difficult going into an ensemble that have worked for many years or months together and then you're sort of jumping in to do this small little piece that you really are limited to knowing the background of it and you just take what you can and you go in and I think... Uh, a couple of times I felt very uncomfortable um, in those situations, but because that's the job, mm. I have to get good at it. Mm. Mm. Because I want, I do want to move through being a guest into a more like supportive role, or a re you know, mm. I then work on knowing it so intimately 
that I walk in there as that character and um, I just have to give it my all. That makes me feel a little more at ease and um, generally people are great to work with mm. uh, and we all have different experiences mm. but I find if I go in and I'm not overly confident with the work then the experience is not as good. You mentioned Elizabeth Kemp and, and we've worked together on two yes. or three, uh, Elis three. Yeah, three of yeah. her amazing workshops. You've also worked with Larry Moss and you, yes. said, you've, you've said that that is one of the real pivotal moments for you in your career yeah. too. Do you want to talk a bit about that? I think working, I work with Larry three times now mm. and, um, and I think thanks to 16th Street that they bring these amazing people yeah. here, Kim Kredges is, I just um, admire so much because mm. he gives so much. Yeah. Um, my first time working with Larry, I, I worked with a great actor, Lee Beckhurst, and we did a scene um, from the Harold Pinter play, uh, The Dumb Waiter. Mm. And I was just grateful to get into Larry, to do Larry's class. Mm. And um, so that was high stakes, and I was very nervous about it. And so was Lee. And Lee was uh, one of the graduates of their full time program their first year. Oh, okay. And um, I think he was quite unsure about who's this old bloke anyway we got along really well and for some uh, we were just fortunate that um, Larry had cast me and Lee in something that was sort of second nature like um, Harold Pinter is like when I'm doing Harold Pinter I feel like I'm at, at home all the words feel like that's what I was hearing when I was growing up ah. he's really yeah and and he's quite a disciplined writer you know really exact it's like musical notes so we, uh, we rehearsed for Larry Moss in that way before we got to see Larry. We rehearsed all the commas, all the full stops, all the pauses. We poured over line by line. And, we and you do pages and pages for yeah, Larry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did, yeah. Mm. So we had two and a bit weeks, but we worked so hard. And um, uh, we get to Larry Moss and we were just said, look, we don't know what we're doing. We're just kicking it around. Let's see what happens. And um, Lee's got a fairly laid back attitude, but he's so good. I just, I just think, you know, he's naturally gifted. Mm. And um, I was lucky to work with him. Mm. But we did this scene and Larry didn't stop this scene. He let the scene run. And I just felt I've arrived. I can do this. And um, Larry was very complimentary and I won't say it was luck, we worked really hard mm. and the w you could mm. see the work and um, that we'd done and but I think also too that we understood, I understood Harold Pinter because I did a lot of work on who is this man. I'm a Pinter fan. Yes. <laughs> yes. One of the things that you learned I think at the Pop-Up Globe was to be able to think on your feet while you're on, while you're on stage. Yes, yes. So tell me about the, about the joke. <laughs> Well, um, when we were doing the show, it was around the globe in 60 minutes, mm. they wanted us to, we helped, um, do we did improv and help collaborate with the writing of the play. So, but there were times where things, you know, happen mm. and you, we had license to be in the moment to sort of go with it. And it is, everything's alive in that environment. So there was a, a, a moment where normally we'd get probably 200 people in the groundlings and another 700 people in the, around the seating. Yeah. But this one particular day, there were only two groundlings, two people. <laughs> and I have a line that says, All right, get out of my way, you <laughs> piles of garbage. We've got a hundred heads to chop off before Smoko. And I knew this line's coming. I sort of thought, oh, that's right. I've got to barge through all these no people. So there were two fellas right at the back there near the door. And um, I said, come here, come here, come up quickly, come to the stage, stand there, stand there, quickly, hurry up. And they stood right at the end of the stage. I said, right, now, get out of my way, you piles of garbage. <laughs> and they, uh, yeah, it was quite funny for everyone else. And I thought that was a way to <laughs> get rid of them and uh, get them to do what I wanted them to do and um, walk off. So that stayed in the show. I had great fun pulling all these people up to the stairs really close and then telling them to get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> so that has just happened and um, uh, one of the other actors in uh, Much Ado About Nothing who playing Don John, he also used it in his, which I was very honoured that he did that, <laughs> use that joke. But it was a, it's lovely. an oldie but a goodie, I think. <laughs>
<laughs> and you also went on as the understudy for some I of did. the roles in the I Pollock did, Globe. Yes. Yeah, so what was that experience like? Because well, that, you, you had to go on with book, didn't yes, you? That, yes. that must be excruciatingly difficult. Well, you know, it was the biggest fear of my life oh. to get, apart from jumping off a pier. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But they, I had, I didn't realise at the time when I signed up for the Pop-Up Globe that I thought I was doing a show. Yeah. And they said, but you've got understudy training. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's all right. But I was understudying for six other old geezers, yeah. six other men, yeah. and 14 characters. Wow. So I had to, when I wasn't doing the Around the Globe in 60 Minutes, I was reading scripts and story and watching them. I had to watch them. But they did say, if you have to go on uh, at short notice, you take the script. I said, okay, that's fine. So over Christmas and New Year, I had, um, I think, it was seven shows in like nine days and did Leonardo with the script in hand. But I played with the audience because I made it obvious I have the script. So there was a couple of bits where um, Dog Bree, there's a bit of improv where Dog Bree, I send, uh, Leonardo sends the yeah. two soldiers off yes. to be at his brother's place the next yes. morning. Yes. And I send them off. And before I sent them off, I told them in the play, of course, the character says that my brother has a daughter, almost the identical to my daughter, mm -hmm. you come and marry her. And then the audience knows, of course, mm -hmm. the audience all look at me and I've got the script. Shut up, I'm telling be quiet, don't <laughs> laugh. Because they start laughing at the joke. Anyway, I send them off to come back the next day and then Dogbury came over and the actors have M fine actor, he said, um, wow, you couldn't write this, could you? You just couldn't write it. And I said, no. And then I look at the script and I go, actually, you can. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so the audience lapped it up. They lapped it up. And, um, you know, there was a dance sequence, which I did my own thing. So I just threw something in from West Side Story, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and just to have fun. Yeah. But they knew I was understudy. They knew I was reading from the script. And I did keep uh, every minute of the day I was reading that script. Mm. So I, I could just refer to it to, to be on cue and to know. Mm. Um, I sort of knew, mm. but um, it was so much fun. Oh, it must have been amazing. It was, it was a real highlight. Yeah, it's a real transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just, you can't help but grow in that situation because you, do, you don't want to be there holding a script reading and be bad. No. No. You don't want to be bad anyway, but no. you know what I mean? People paid money to come and see you. Yeah, that's right. And if somebody's not in, you have to go up. You, mm. So um, mm. I think I grew, yeah. I grew over that period. Yeah. And I think another of your really growing experiences was your tram and train work. Yes, yeah. Now, tell us about that. Well, um, with a group we called ourselves Dish Dum. We were around for a little while with some young actors and comedians. Mm -hmm. There was five all together and um, we'd get together and do a bit of sketch comedy and do a bit of improv the night before and then we'd meet on public transport the next morning on a packed tram or a packed train and we'd just run comedy sketches or jokes um, which got a great response and it was such good training mm -hmm. but really in the moment and you really had to be totally invested in the character you were playing and dedicated to the character and I think Good improv, when you see someone do improv and they're totally um, dedicated in that character, they, it's good, you can go with them. So, so there you were, you'd hop on the train or the tram, it would be pretty much packed because it's, yeah, peak, it's hour. peak hour. So you've got people in your face yes. and you're going to start performing. Yes. Um, we had some sketches that we would do, mm. um, a particular sketch called a revolution whereas uh, Joseph Green's on the telephone uh, and he's playing a role that he doesn't want to go to work but he is going to work so he's talking to his mum and he's saying I am going to work mum but I hate it I don't want to do this I just I just want to be a comedian I don't want to do this anymore yes but I am I know I need money so he hangs up and he's like I wouldn't believe you wouldn't believe it and nobody everybody sort of he's a bit loud so we sort of everybody mm. is a bit like oh god this guy's a bit loud on the public transport and then uh, another actor Rebecca Green she said I heard what you just said I'm the same I'm a lawyer and I hate my job and she actually in this would get to tears yeah so we would all have a bit of empathy there yep. and then um, 
And there was another actor, comedian, Rhett Hughes, pipe in and say, yeah, come on, everybody. Are we doing, we on this train, we're all, you know, going to do the same thing and we love what we're doing or do we have to do what we do, you know? Aren't we all just artists? And if you keep doing it, you're going to end up like that old bloke over there and point to me. <laughs> and I was sort of like, what, what? And they say, they're talking about you. I said, what? And then I just get up and I go, he's right. I'm an accountant. I've been on this train for 30 years, which everyone laughed. I don't know why, but anyway. And, so, and all I ever wanted to do was be a yachtsman. So I'm going to get off and I'm going to be the yachtsman I've always wanted to be. And then there's another actor behind me who would say, um, uh, excuse me, sir, I'm quite wealthy. I have a yacht and I'd like that dream to come true. <laughs> and I'd say, you're messing with me. No, no. So this was the sketch. And Joseph would say, uh, Rhett would say, let's get off two stops, let's get off and go down to the Arrow and cause a revolution. And, and Joseph would say, the final line was, oh, I've been waiting two stops my whole life, I'm getting off now. Mm -hmm. So we'd all just jump off. But people were with us, yeah, totally I can imagine. with us. Yeah. yeah, So you would do that, you'd hop off and then you'd wait for the next train. And, and jump off and yeah. do another one. Wow. Or do it again. Yeah, they were really appreciative. Mm -hmm. And we, had, we were in the moment, we had to. Yeah. So what did you learn from that experience? How did it, how did it shift your craft? I think to be totally committed to it. Yeah. No second guess and get out of my own way. Mm. You know, just let go. Just let go and trust it's going to be okay. Mm. Easier said than done. Yes. So it's been a great lesson if you're actually able to do that. I think the hardest one was singing. You know, when we did a, um, a, um, a tribute to David Bowie when he passed mm. away. I think within that week, David Bowie passed away. So we said, let's do a tribute. And I was in a packed tram and I was starting this song. And there's a man like really close to me. Wow. And there were people everywhere. And I was like really tight. And you couldn't see the other actors? We, I, I got a message saying now, right, go. And um, I was like, all right. I just started ground control to major. And this guy's like, <laughs> and I just kept going and then Joseph would join in and Rhett would join in and then yeah. Dan would do the countdown and mm. it was quite, quite exciting. Mm. But I felt no fear, just go, just do it. Mm. But in that moment before, I'm going to start singing. <laughs> it was really interesting, Yeah, I thought. Wow. Such a varied and interesting experience, set of experience over the past few years. Yes, yeah, it is. Um, given your business background, have you thought about producing? Have you thought about starting a theatre company? I thought about working with, um, not so much for money, but producing, I've thought about producing. Mm -hmm. I think I'd be a good producer mm -hmm. and pull things together. Mm -hmm. And um, so I might, I might do that a bit later, but at the moment, I really want to keep, I, I still have this fire for acting mm. and I, I want to be f totally dedicated to that mm. and um, see if I can hone that craft and um, and there's no end game for me really, it's how, how long I want to do, do what I'm doing mm. because um, I may never break through into the mainstream where um, I'm known or anything, but that's not the, the goal. The goal is just, I mean, I'm constantly busy. I'm working with amazing people mm. and um, I just enjoy what I'm doing right now because then that, to me, is the measure of success. I like to work with other actors that want to do come and do scene work and put together things if I have time, but usually my schedule's so tight. Mm. Um, I've got a lot of projects in the pipe work that will take me into the next eight months or so and they're you know half a dozen jobs so I'm very fortunate so while they're still rolling I'm just going to keep going I do have dreams like you know I do have dreams of um, being in an ongoing series or you know a good support role in a major feature film mm. or you know more theatre mm. maybe MTC would be a dream mm. yeah so who knows very nice. I think that's a great place to end our conversation today. Roy, thank you so much for your time. It's been fascinating. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and I have loved having Daisy. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's enjoyed it. She's all the way through She it. has. She's enjoyed it. <laughs>
I've been here today with Roy Barker. Thank you for watching.